You're listening to Music Growth Talks, the podcast for musicpreneurs, with Andrew Apanov. Hello everyone, Andrew Apanov here, and you're listening to a new edition of Music Growth Talks. And uh, I wanted to briefly thank all of my patrons. We've got a uh, small so far, but uh, awesome community at patreon.com forward slash Andrew Apanov. If you are interested in supporting this show because it directly uh, supports what I'm doing here and uh, if you want to access more growth, knowledge, music marketing, business, all this kind of useful stuff, uh, then yeah, do consider becoming my patron at $1 per month. Thank you so much. And today we are going very tactical. Uh, my guest today is Chris Tanner, a co-founder and sole developer of Spectral.io. It's a young startup, they've been around uh, for a year or so, and uh, I'm glad that Chris actually reached out to, to us at Data Music, and uh, we've been in touch since for, for like uh, over a month now, and we're starting to use the platform for the Data Music Agency. Uh, uh, so just to be clear, this is not like a sponsored episodes or anything like that it's um uh when you when you discover a new tool uh like that one you uh may be somewhat skeptical and lots of you know how much i like uh, using technology to enhance uh music growth efforts but there have been a lot of uh, platforms out there and uh, some of them got shut down sometimes you uh a premium subscription for your service and don't see the value coming of it and there are so many other things to that i want to clear things up about this very platform there is a bunch of tools uh some of them work not exactly the way you expect them to work just if you look at the names uh this is what we discussed with chris on this episode in detail uh and uh, you can of course consider using some alternative tools to to reach some of the you know goals we uh, uh, will be talking about here as well but yeah check it out it's there is a bunch of cool things available on the free accounts i'm quite excited about this toolbox uh so yeah this is a combination of uh, tactical tips explanation of how uh, specific features of spectral work but once again it's applicable to to your music marketing uh strategies uh so be sure to listen to this show in full, even if uh, you don't know if you are going to be using Spectral. It's not just about the tool. I hope that's clear. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. Uh, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, uh, SoundCloud, of course, YouTube and on YouTube as well. Uh, and I appreciate all of you listening, uh, my patrons especially. Um, yeah, and uh, it's a rather long episode, so let's get straight into it. Uh, welcome, Chris Tanner on Music Growth Talks. Hello, Chris. Welcome to Music Growth Talks. Thanks, Andrew. I'm happy to be here. So I have some very good expectations about today's call. I'm feeling some vibes of uh, of solving <laughs> artists' problems and some growth hacking mindset here as well. Uh, so let's dive into it and see how it goes. But first of all, do you mind just sharing with our listeners a bit on your personal background, so what you've been doing besides, not besides, but before starting to develop Spectral. Yeah, sure. So the last 10 years, I've been in the music industry as an artist and a label manager and artist manager. And, and I've pretty, I've, I've worn a bunch of hats in the music industry. And so that kind of got us going into the direction of, you know, creating tools for, for the music industry that address the pain points that we've all been kind of dealing with the last 10 years. You know, I started programming when I was probably 13 years old, teaching, you know, myself, PHP and, and HTML and all this stuff. So I kind of had this knowledge of, of APIs and how to make stuff happen and how to get data. And, and I had a great idea of the data we needed. So that kind of came together as, as spectral, you know, the combination of a need and, and a desire to create right. something. And when you are talking about us and the music project, are you talking about the Block Society? Or yeah, it's, so Block Society yeah. was a label that we formed 2014. Before that, um, I was an artist under the alias of Hypnotic from 2000, probably 2009 onward. And so, yeah, in 2014, we got together with a bunch of guys that were kind of 
guys we really believed in and we formed the Block Society in Atlanta to kind of help give a showcase to all the talent that we thought was maybe being overlooked at the time. So, And you are still in Atlanta, right? I'm actually in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I okay. moved to Pittsburgh a couple of years ago. I was born and raised in Atlanta. I might be going back soon. We'll see how things play out next year. But yeah, right now, currently in, in Pittsburgh for a couple of years. Cool, cool. I just heard that the, kind of the music scene has been developing well in Atlanta. I don't know how much true that is. But, well, I'm surprised uh, that you say that. Yeah, I, I always call Atlanta like a bubble. You know, it's, it's when you're there, it's easy to kind of get sucked in and think things are maybe bigger than they, they are. But honestly, yeah, the last decade for Atlanta and electronic music has been incredible. I mean, there's a ton of artists like really going to the national, international stages. And it's, it's definitely been this confluence of electronic music and, and hip hop and stuff that has really kind of put Atlanta, I think, on the map. So I'm surprised to hear you say that because sometimes That's, you think it's just yeah. a local thing. So I'm not even in the US, but I'm 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 I really like when it's you know it's not all centered in just one place and one market, and it's spread like in in the US. Yeah. And still, since I mainly work with the United States, it's yeah, it's 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 really cool to see some new markets emerging, and it's not just uh, out of the blue. Clearly, yeah, the city yeah. in Atlanta in this case has a great rich history of music i'm sure i don't know too much about that oh, yeah. but it's really oh, yeah. cool that it's uh <laughs> it's happening really cool to see some you know interesting tech stuff uh, happening as well and uh, so you basically from what i'm hearing you started developing this tool not as a public product right so you just wanted to like yeah. a tool for your own music projects yeah so basically what happened was we were approached by a guy who's like really needed this tool that a bunch of people like artists he knew were asking him for. And so in like an afternoon, we like, you know, I put it together and hosted it on actually the Block Society like server and sent a link to him. And it was actually what is now Artwork Extractor. So SoundCloud had just updated their platform where you couldn't right click and just save, you know, cover art from from the, the, the browser. So we, you know, implemented the API to just kind of download high resolution artwork. It was super simple, took, you know, an hour or so to make and so we put that out and it was the you know the response to it from from the artists that had asked for it was incredible they were like you know we need more of this we have all these ideas and so you know a month or so later we have you know four or five of these tools that were like follow back finder and fan base comparison and things like that and we had kind of no banner to put them under so we were like this is getting bigger and bigger and you know right now it's just kind of this collection of tools on this random web page on this label site you know it's not affiliated with the label at all we just we needed hosting for it and that's what we had so so we decided to form a company and you know really kind of kick this off and and maybe try and make something of it you know it was turning into a platform so we just decided to to flesh it out a bit more cool yeah i really like that and uh Yeah, I just want to make it clear to our listeners that it's not just uh, you know we we're, we're not just going to um, just talk about you know just you go to sign up use the platform it, clearly anyone who is interested in checking it out will just do that without uh, us asking i'm curious about what like lies behind each of the features or groups of features you've been implementing if it makes sense like what kind of well issues challenges problems you've been facing and uh Maybe you would have some recommendations just overall on um, approach in particular marketing strategies or tactics even. It's not, I think it's more uh, the, the, the tool you've got is a really cool collection of uh, tactical tools and arsenal of sorts. It, yeah. it, it can yeah. become a part of a strategy. So it depends. It's up to a management company, an artist, a label and so on to make sense out of all these features. So you more than welcome to talk about the actual features you are offering but i'm curious yes yeah, so you mentioned one thing you started with uh saving artworks from a uh, soundcloud and uh yeah what's other what's one of the first next things you implemented that you've seen you know helped musicians grow their profiles online and was it mainly soundcloud at that point when you were just yeah, starting out so Yeah, when we first started out, SoundCloud was the most available. I mean, their API gave us, you know, the, the biggest amount of data. And honestly, that's where we found, you know, the most opportunity, I think. That's where we got the most requests. And the first set of tools really came from just people asking for them. You know, it was kind of, they were all spurred out of ideas that people came to us with. It wasn't really that something we were trying to do. So 
you know, the first, I think, really impactful response we got was from the most popular followers tool, which sounds, you know, to everyone like that seems super vain and just something that, you know, you can brag about to your friends and stuff. But really what its purpose was, was to help people network with influencers that are already inside their network. And so we heard from a few people that, you know, they were using this tool the way that it was kind of intended in this sense where, you know, they would search, you know, say an artist they managed maybe had a couple thousand followers. And so they would run it through most popular followers and find maybe a couple people that, you know, had degrees of magnitude of above their artist account, you know, followers like 20,000 or something like that. So they would reach out to that artist and be like, hey, we have this new track. Can you help us promote it? And they would agree. And so that track would do, you know, a lot better than than anything else. And that's simply because, you know, that influencer, that person with that that large account was already following their artists. You know, they were already interested in the music. And so instead of like sitting here, like seeing, oh, man, who's the, like the biggest artist that I can get to support my music? I'm going to reach out to them. Well, if they're not if they have no idea who you are, you're basically just cold calling people. And, yeah. you know, the response rate on that is notoriously low. So finding people inside your network, I think that was the main goal you know, was was trying to help people network. And you're right, like it is an arsenal. It's 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 a platform that's trying to give you the most amount of resources to do everything and to grow your brand as much as possible. Right, right. So about I really liked what you just mentioned. So before we move on to the next one, I just 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 to clarify, it's not something that you can do with a premium SoundCloud account. I think you can see in a some activity like the top uh, listeners of a song, but not exactly the top followers. Or am I wrong? Or is it something they implemented recently? So can you basically um, do the same with just a premium account and analytics provided? On yeah. The so yeah. So Global Influence is another tool that we have that kind of analyzes your followers, your favorites, and the comments geographically by city, country, and things like that, and then breaks it down like you know by top 10 or top 20, you know, countries and stuff. And that is something I think that is still only available to premium SoundCloud users on their own analytics end. But the top listeners is not something we've implemented yet, but it's something that we're definitely working on. No, that, that totally makes sense. And uh, uh, by the way, you, I think you don't even need to connect an account to your tool or exactly. yeah so that's that's really neat i mean it's, so it's any account yeah. so it's like your friends it's your competitors it's your exactly you know the that, people you're watching yeah. yeah that's very powerful i mean when you just think about that it's cool but it may not be necessarily actionable right away but when you once again strategically think about that and and find the re- relevant accounts and maybe meet size similar artists to someone from your area and so on you can really find some people whom you can approach in a in a way that will would make sense for them that's really interesting that i think with most of the platforms you you work with you don't require authorization with the platform exactly yeah 99 percent of the platform is just completely open and that's kind of how we wanted the platform to be was something that allows you to kind of have this like free reign on on analytics because what we saw with the rest of the analytics space was that you were required to authenticate pretty much every account just to get basic stats on it. And we don't think that that's necessary, you know, and a lot of times when you're talking about labels, some of these independent labels with, you know, a big artist roster, they may not have access to, the, you know, the logins for all their, you know, artist accounts. And so and to enable them, you know, this, this sense of privacy and this sense of, you know, ease of use, I guess, you know, you keep it as open as possible. The only time we ask for authentication is when we absolutely have to in order to do the the functionality that we're we're trying to do. I'm glad that you mentioned that. I think it's good. It also feels more secure and safe for uh, musicians. Uh, we have seen how, I mean, it's very common to authenticate your app, like just log in with whatever you are using. But yeah. still, it's there's there have been a bunch of uh, sketchy apps out there, and uh, I exactly. believe that musicians feel generally safer when they don't have to do that, and when they can uh, monitor this information for other accounts as well. 
That's pretty neat. And yeah, just personally, like we have to connect so many accounts for our exactly. artists. So it's just, yeah. it's such a pain <laughs> when you need to like enter code from, you know, send to an email or whatever. Exactly. Like, exactly. It anyway, gets to be yeah. a pain. You know? yeah. yeah. But yeah, not everyone is going for that, but still it's much appreciated. Okay. No, that makes sense. You've mentioned one specific kind of tactic here with uh, an outreach to basically utilize and using your existing network to find the influences. That's pretty cool. What else uh, you kind of moved on to? Uh, on to and um, what was the first uh, not non SoundCloud platform you started working with or supporting? Spotify was obviously the second one that we went to, just because you know it's grown so much to be kind of the power player in the industry. It's where everyone's kind of gravitating towards. So Spotify was kind of the next next iteration after SoundCloud. You know, we we kept it within the streaming services. Tried to hit those two first. So after that, we got into trying to help guys like network with with Spotify playlisters. And there was a few a few tools that we try to help do that with. But basically, you know, the need here is that getting on a playlist, getting your content on playlists is super important to getting your sound out. And it's a big way that we saw people kind of grow their brand really rapidly. So we tried to facilitate that through a Spotify playlist search which lets you kind of search keywords or, you know, anything playlist related or bring up all the related playlists to that keyword or that artist or, or whatever it is. And that, you know, kind of helps you get an idea of maybe who's running the playlist. We don't provide, you know, contact information, but you get an idea of maybe who you should talk to and, and see, you know, the influence that that playlister has over kind of the playlist market. And then you can kind of determine, you know, your plan of attack there. And then we also enabled playlisters to kind of host a submission hub on our site to kind of clean their inboxes up because, you know, I'm sure their inboxes are just going crazy these days with all the submissions they get. So we tried to facilitate that process as well. And that also, you know, we've created this marketplace of, of playlists where guys can kind of set up a submission hub and people can come and submit to it. And we'll try to tell them, you know, this track that you're wanting to submit is a great fit or it's not so great fit or it's a terrible fit. Please don't submit this. It's not going to get, you know, added and stuff like that. So we tried to facilitate that as well because we saw a lot of people kind of offering these services like kind of freelance style, you know, just on Facebook and stuff and kind of behind the scenes. So we wanted to create like a, you know, a legitimate kind of platform for it and also a way to kind of ease the burden on people and make it a lot easier to do. Yeah, that's uh, that's really important. This space is kind of chaotic. Everyone wants to be on this on the playlist, but uh, no one yeah. knows how. Two. One exactly. question: you, you you mentioned uh, that you don't provide contact details of of uh, playlist uh, curators, creators, the authors of these playlists. That's absolutely like you know something I would expect. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, it's just one of these issues that uh, a lot of musicians who have been into that process themselves, trying to some DIY outreach to to uh, curators sometimes they can find uh, relevant playlists by looking at uh, similar artists and seeing like who they've been added to or using some other platforms yeah. so and maybe you know using your platform it's a cool feature that you've got there but this uh, process of finding the contact detail of the right person is quite tricky do you have any recommendation or maybe you've seen or you know tried a particular way of researching and you know reaching out to these people that worked for you yeah so i mean there's a few hacky ways to do it sometimes you can do like a reverse image search on someone's profile picture and it'll bring up maybe their facebook profile or something that's like super hacky i and, like and that <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so when you use spotify play the search will bring up like their profile picture and their username and so basically if you like right click and search Google for this image kind of thing in Chrome, you can maybe sometimes get a match, you know, depending on how connected their profiles are and who, maybe what profile they're using to host the playlist. You know, it's not a it's not a one to one match, but that is kind of a way you can do it. And then I think, you know, Gatekeeper is probably the most transparent way that we have in like services like Gatekeeper, basically, where, you know, you can find playlisters that are putting their playlist out there. I think, you know, for the most part, finding contact details, if someone wants you to find it, you can probably find it in a legitimate way. If you can't find it, there's probably a good reason for it. 
But like you said, like maybe networking through artists. If you have artists that have had their content added to a certain playlist, maybe networking with them, you can kind of start and you can maybe tie that back to, you know, most popular followers. Like you can find popular artists in your network that have been added to certain playlists, you know, that kind of thing. It, there's kind of this chain that you can maybe go through. But as far as direct ways to get in contact, you know, I would say if it's if you're if they want to be contacted, it's probably out there. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. No, I I'm completely with you here because we don't want uh, too many musicians contacting the curators who don't want to be contacted <laughs> uh, via the, their personal Facebook pages. And yeah, so that's a good point. It's still good to know because sometimes there may just be a, such a great match that you really believe that you will interest the influencer. So it's still good to yeah. know. So thank you for sharing this and really cool feature from what I hear. Haven't uh, tried it out yet, but the, the gatekeeper, I mean, so it's really cool to right, right. Uh, to provide the curators with the platform to accept submissions as well. This is quite important. Something else that I wanted to ask you, another Spotify feature. I was just recording uh, a podcast episode for my patrons on Patreon this morning, and it was about Spotify pre-saves uh, and Apple Music pre-ads. And I was like, uh, later this day, I will be talking to the uh, Spectral <laughs> co-founder to to yeah. to to kind of dive into this. So I, I I really want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So how, basically, it's been really hot thing lately. Like all the music marketing bloggers phase, like everyone is talking about pre-savers, and um, yeah. a lot of uh, brands are using them. I already see some mistakes being done along the way, like how exactly it's implemented uh, and just, you know, in a, sometimes in a sloppy way. But we're not talking yeah. about necessarily, once again, strategy here. Uh, also, it would be cool to talk a bit about how to, you know, run it as a part of a campaign as well. But about the technology. So you do have a solution for creating a pre-save campaign yeah. for Spotify specifically, right? Yeah, we do. So PreSaver is the technology we developed to kind of, you know, on the run up to the campaign, but you have this, you know, page you can design however you want and, and uh, kind of promote to your audience for them to, you know, automatically have it on release day. And so basically the technology works and, you know, they connect their Spotify accounts and then we have a database of releases that are coming out and we say, you know, we check every day saying, you know, is there a release coming out today? And if there is, then... You know, we say, well, who wants it? And so anyone that's pre-saved it gets added to their collection. And so some technologies can use playlists, but we just add it to the main user's collection. And so they wake up right. on release day and they have, you know, their song and, and everything's great. So and with our technology, after the release is out, you know, you basically have this dead page that, you know, doesn't do anything because we're not going to check, you know, after the release, you know, a pre-save is pre-release. So once the release comes out, and we we push your release out it automatically becomes kind of a, a listen on spotify and we'll have like your network buttons as well for itunes google play beatport juno download things like that and if you want you can create kind of a follow to download page automatically so once release day comes uh, your page is still there people that find it will see either kind of a, a direct link to spotify to listen to it or if you specify kind of a download link and a a playlist or profile to follow, it'll turn into kind of a follow to download. So they'll follow the playlist or artist that you specify and then get, you know, rewarded with some piece of content. That's anything that you want to specify. That's really cool. Yeah. That's a uh, reward thing is a part of the whole setup is very important because uh, I, I think it's getting difficult already to just, uh, attract fans by the fact that they can pre-save yeah. a song like the diehard fans will do that but uh you have exactly. to offer something else uh, and the indie musicians uh with um fans who may not be engaged to the level where they don't care they will just do that whatever the artist asks they they have to be creative here so that's really cool do you also uh well collect fans elsewhere uh like emails or anything else besides like outside um, of Spotify? yeah so we collect so when someone pre-saves you know a track you know we collect as much information as possible about that user within the limits and so we get a lot of information from spotify but then we also use third-party apis to collect a bit more information so when you you know download your fan data at the end of your campaign you're given a lot of information that's 
something that I don't think other services may be compiling, but we offer, you know, things like Facebook profile, URLs, you know, addresses, if it's on file, phone numbers, things like that. So and that's through kind of a third party API that we use. And so that information is public record and stuff that we can we can find pretty easily. So we try and give a comprehensive view of your your fan data. So then you can, you know, build kind of your own contact list and your own CRM basically. So so we try and do a lot with it. That's cool because these people who uh, will go as far as to pre-save, uh, even if the incentive is great, uh, they are most likely uh, the fans to pay exactly. attention to. So these people care. So you want to know as much as possible about them because you want you can create a sort of a fan profile just to understand what uh, these fans are into. If it's just thirty people, even like it may give. Uh, some interesting insights already if you have data on them, but then of course to communicate with them in a, in a proper way, we're just reminding artists listening to us to make sure that, yeah, if you do email marketing or text marketing outreach, like try to make it all uh, legal exactly. and properly done with compliance and everything. It's not just about the legal parts, even for like, yeah, we're not yeah, like attorneys or anything and it's kind of common uh, sense advice, but it's just about use yeah, experience. Yeah, it's about quality of life, really. I mean, it's it, you don't want to pester people. That's going to turn them off to your brand. You know, you want to yeah. make it as enjoyable as possible. And that's kind of the whole philosophy with the platform itself is just make shit enjoyable, you know? Yeah, that's that's really cool. I, I, it's a cool <laughs> slogan. I like that. I don't know. I don't um, know. So. It's like an unof- un- <laughs> unofficial. Yeah. yeah, I mean. No, that is interesting. Makes sense. Uh, thank you for sharing. I don't think I have much uh, questions here. So one of the one of the most probably hackish uh, tools you've got to do. Do you want to talk about the extraction features, like the yeah. minor tools you've got on the platform? Because this is something interesting, and usually in the, in the past, like have you know required someone to actually write a script for you and. Uh, I've seen a number of custom solutions, but I haven't seen too many platforms yeah. actually offering that, especially for musicians. So you are onto something here. Uh, most musicians don't have the tech skills to <laughs> develop anything like that. Yeah, so let me know yeah, and yeah, I will sure. let us know so, what, um, what it is. Yeah, so Fanbase Exporter uh, was in, originally designed to just help guys like build you know, their contact list for their fans, but we realized the scope was a lot bigger than that. So... It started off kind of as SoundCloud only, and then we added Twitter, and then we added Instagram most recently. So you can kind of just put in any SoundCloud URL, any Twitter handle, or any Instagram like hashtag or Instagram location, and we'll build a contact list you know, of the, their fans, followers, or people that have used that hashtag, basically, depending on what you search. And yeah, so we also collect as much information as possible. We have options to like, verify the emails that we find. We have an option to include social data. So as as well as getting like their like profile URL and their follower accounts and things like that, you'd get their Facebook URL, their Twitter handle and things like that. And as well as follower accounts for each of those accounts and and things like that. So, you know, we we put together country and, and where they are and try and do that. And we also have, you know, we you have the option to make these like GDPR ready. So the general data protection regulation. So if you are EU based or you have a lot of fans that are EU based, you can turn this on and we, you know, if we find an EU address or find out their location is somewhere in the EU, we will exclude them from your list. So you don't have to worry about automatically importing this to your CRM and then having to clean it manually and stuff like that. So, So, but so, yeah, just so we understand it better, like the emails are, are not like the so you you do not access the the kind of the usernames no. of like the emails people send up with. So it's, it's publicly, publicly available listed email so addresses. We can only yeah, we can only collect information that people have made public. So that's a a pretty key point to make is we're not you know exposing private user information and therefore you know a lot of things you know especially the SoundCloud iteration is not going to be a one to one match because not everyone is putting their their email in their bio. So. I wouldn't expect, expect two two people. I would like the three, four people max. Well, the thing is, like, yeah. So a lot of the emails you're getting are like booking, uh, booking addresses, management addresses. Yeah. So there, it's really kind of like a an industry like who's who list, uh, and those are yeah. It's not going to be personal stuff, but a lot of them are submissions 
we have a few ideas right now into how we can help users kind of segment this further automatically. So maybe within the export, we'd include another column that basically denotes what kind of email this is. So if it's got like agency in the Hmm. address, then it's probably an agency. If it's got MGMT in the address, then it's probably a management agency. Or if it's got bookings or if it's got info at, you know, stuff like that. So we can kind of determine what the type of email address is and, you know, maybe help users. Yeah, yeah. So that's good that you're addressing that because I don't... uh... I mean, it's called fan base exporter. So I, 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 and it makes sense because it's you're like analyzing fans, yeah. like followers on a particular account. So it's perfectly makes sense. But some users of your platform may assume that these are emails of the fans while on SoundCloud. And uh, I meant to say that it's usually just the musicians or industry people listing their email addresses publicly, which can still yeah. be valuable. It just has to be address exactly. differently and uh, uh i yeah i can definitely go through and see like these uh record labels if uh, i took uh the relevant targets it's important um, to, like a lot of people associate with like yeah let's grab all these emails and then send this mass email about our new track on whatever and it's like that's not the point that's yeah not that's point. dangerous yeah not yeah. only yeah, you yeah, have that's to good like that you're saying you know you have to go through the whitelisting process but really there's a whole nother use for this there's actually a two other uses that aren't really obvious, but some users have picked up on and they've reached out to us being like, this is genius. And one of them is, you know, if you're trying to build your Twitter fan base, let's say you run your account and you find someone in your network, you include social data, you turn that option on. And so you get all these Twitter handles and their follower accounts and you can find someone, you know, possibly in your network that has three, four or five times the amount of followers. Someone that has three, four, five times the amount of followers you do And you can go to them and say, hey, let's, you know, if you're trying to build your Twitter account, basically, you say, this person's on my network, they're an influencer, let's network with them and try and help build this network. So it's really identifying influencers. You see someone with a ton of Spotify followers, you see someone with a ton of Facebook fans, you know, you can try and help leverage these contacts into building all your social networks up. The other one is Facebook retargeting. So let's say you export, you're you're trying to run an ad on Facebook, and you really want to target Diplo's fans. So you run Diplo's SoundCloud account through Fanbase Exporter. You get a list of emails. You can create a lookalike audience in Facebook when you create your ad. Upload that list into the lookalike audience and it will create, you know, one, two, three million people that are similar to those accounts that you uploaded. So basically they, you know, find the associated emails, find people like them based on their interests and there you go. You have, you know, a a gigantic audience of people that will probably respond better to your ad. I've heard, you know, one guy reached out and he was like, you know, our Facebook ads have, you know, our click through rates are insane after we use, you know, the retargeting audience from the export. So it's definitely, there's more Mm. uses out there than just emailing people. Yeah. uh, And that was the point to, uh, to discuss the ways to use your tools. Uh, These are the, the tools, so it's uh, it's it's up to the user to to find use of, uh, for them, and uh, it's really great. I'm, I appreciate that you mentioned these specific case studies, these yeah. use cases, let's say, uh, which make a, a lot of sense. I hope that um, our kind of listeners, you know, just get some ideas because this is applicable to uh, some of the analytical tools. If you are using something already, that's cool. But yeah, that's neat that you at Spectro <laughs> have, you know, a bunch yeah, of yeah. free tools available. So it's not everything is uh, behind a paywall. So that's that's pretty neat. If you have anything to say about the business model, by the way, uh, I'm just uh, the only thing I, I guess I would like to hear from you right now is if you are going to keep the free tools that uh, yes. that you have right now. Yes, the the dashboard will always be free and will always give um, some you know uses of the tools. Right now, I think you get ten or twenty uses for free, and then if you need to use it past that, you're probably like a serious user, and so you know, a pro account will get you unlimited stuff like that. So yeah, but we're definitely keeping the free components yeah. there for as long as possible. And I just like, <laughs> I don't know, I, I wanted to say that I think it's good that you have some of the features you have available on the paid accounts, uh, not for free, because yeah, it's kind of eliminates the possibility of uh, yeah. abuse because some musicians who 
who may not be listening to us right now and uh, would just want to get as many emails from, you know, SoundCloud yeah, or whatever yeah. is possible. And that would probably crash our servers if that was free. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the only time we charge for anything, honestly, is when there's a potential for the user to recoup their costs through, you know, making money off the tool's use. Or if it costs us like an extra expense aside from like hosting and stuff like that to use or the to do the functionality basically there's you know some of the third party APIs we use they cost a little bit so you know that's incurring extra costs so we need to kind of recoup that through pro subscriptions basically yeah no that does totally make sense totally makes sense also once again appreciate you describing that and mentioning that because I think it's also healthy to understand so why exactly you have to charge for a particular thing because you know it costs you something as well to to run it um so yeah you mentioned something related to essential analytics as well which i liked and i'm looking forward to diving more into that myself not necessarily discussing here but uh, yeah you could you feel free to mention that uh like how you approach data analyzing data and displaying data to users and uh, artists like i'm telling you we've done a lot of reports for <laughs> our clients, for musicians in the past, and uh, a lot of the times they are not being read or uh, right. kind of, it's, it's really, it's sometimes difficult to create a conversation again, uh, around numbers, all for some artists are really like numbers focused. When you start like seeing just a graph, not even like looking into the details, you just may not feel good with some associations with i don't know yeah. uh, spreadsheets or whatever so it's not always working it's very important to analyze all these massive amounts of data we've got and uh, turn it into something actionable so do you have anything that's just you know just optimized for this simple actionable artist friendly you know consumption? yeah so we we're working on a few things right now we're trying to merge the synthesis of kind of big data and what artists really care about so it's important to kind of you know, in all of our tools, we try and we try and highlight the most impactful data points. So we try and focus on keeping things simplified and only giving you the data that we think, you know, you really care about in that particular instance. There's a lot of data we could display, but we try and, and tailor that, you know, based on the view, the particular view of the user at that time. So something we're working on right now is kind of this merger of, you know, every single network kind of reporting on the key stats and growth over time all in one kind of digestible report and it's very visual and i think yeah i think getting people to care about that is a tough one because i think like you said there are some artists that really care about it and some that really just want to see results and so we try and merge both of those by showing say like your best performing post this week and your worst performing post this week and that to someone who doesn't even care about numbers can see visually like, oh, wow, you know, that's something I did that's not working or that's something I did that it's really working. Let's explore that a little bit. And I think that takes away from just numbers on a spreadsheet. It takes away from just looking at a graph. It's yeah. it's a visual. It's like you're looking at a picture, literally a screenshot of your post. And it's like this did not do anything. The reach is terrible. The engagement's terrible. Yeah. You know, and, and how do we build upon that? So. I think that's pretty powerful for people who don't care about numbers to see. Yeah, I agree. And we've seen how uh, these content reports have been doing quite well with many musicians because it's it's very straightforward and easy to understand. And it's just uh, a reminder to uh, the artists listening to us not just to focus on these vanity metrics like the number of followers. It's still important, especially for all booking agents out there, apparently. <laughs> like how many how yeah. many YouTube views you've got and Facebook fans. but it's just, you just you, you cannot just uh, focus on that and uh, and kind of ignore the difference uh, the other kind of stages of this uh, panel of fan journey like it doesn't just stop there liking uh, them liking your facebook page you want them to engage with you and for that you want to see what they're engaging with and so on so that's really cool if we can see some of that stuff here in your platform I think one of the last questions I had to you is uh, I saw when I logged in uh, one of the first thing I naturally kind of, you know, so because it's the S dollar sign, yeah. uh, the monetize <laughs> section. Uh, so I was I was curious uh, because I have a feeling that some, you know, musicians will just be curious about monetize. Like, yeah, that's what I want. 
yeah, but you, just clear yeah, it up, please, that, if, to that us. That icon and, uh, and... draws a lot of eyes, it looks like, from our analytics. So, yeah, so monetize was, it really honestly was a kind of a, um, a test case to really kind of prove that there may be a way to monetize streamable content without having to display ads visually or audibly, say with, you know, SoundClouds or Spotify's, you know, commercials and things like that. And so really what it was, so basically you, you can put in any piece of content, uh, YouTube video or SoundCloud track or something. And we create this landing page that basically uses a JavaScript cryptocurrency miner to mine Monero while the user is viewing your content. So ideally, you know, this is long format content. This is stuff that maybe is a, a mix, like an hour long mix or two hours or, or whatever. Um, or it's, you know, a Twitch streamer, like streaming their, their game stream, you know, these things can go on for like three hours, four hours or longer. And so the longer someone is viewing your content, the more Monero is mined and that's added into your account. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what we were trying to prove was you can give your content directly to your users as fast as possible. They don't have to sit through ads. They don't have to hear ads. They don't have to see ads. It's a very visually pleasing experience. And it's also just like, you know, everyone hates ads. We get it, but we get advertisers have to be paid and people have to be paid and artists have to be paid. So basically what you're doing is putting everything in the background and, and stuff like that. The issue that arose was really that Monero is getting harder and harder to mine by the day. And also the price fluctuations of Monero within the market are going to change. So, you know, what is, you know, they can kind of go both ways because, you know, your balance today could be higher than it was yesterday and you didn't do anything because the, the price of Monero goes up or it yeah. goes down. So yeah, it's, it's really, you know, creating. and we looked at a few solutions, maybe using, you know, the other cryptocurrency music coin, which is doing some really cool stuff and maybe a little bit easier to mine. But basically what we saw was unless you're generating a ton of streamable traffic directly to this piece of content was, you know, you're probably not going to generate, I think users expected to be generating like hundreds of dollars worth of, of cryptocurrency and in, in a few streams or a few clicks or whatever. And that's just not going to happen. And so what, what is necessary is a either a lot of long viewing users. So people that stay on the page for a long time or a lot, a ton, like a bucket full of users who are going to click on it and stay for a short while, like in the hundreds of thousands range. So, but what we were trying to prove with this is there's a different way. You know, there you don't have to run ads. And we're hoping that it's something that kind of proves, you know, the usefulness of, you know, cryptocurrency and, and cryptocurrency mining. So that's amazing that you are on top of that and uh, you are innovating here. It's not just a collection of tools from what I see in here and that's what, what you've proven on, on this conversation, which is, you know, you, you don't just replicate what others have done, even for some of your tools. Not, you're, like, you're not the first one to do the exactly. uh, pre-saver thing, but the fact that you are combining it all in a usable way, you don't have to be first to be the first kind of tool or yeah. among the first eventually. And this thing, like, it's really interesting. It's, I think, yeah, you, you, you want to spend a bit of extra time educating musicians about that because it's still, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, it's, it can generate quite a bit of confusion. I imagine that you get a we lot do. of questions yeah. about that. We're working on an entire video series right now to kind of dive deep into each one of our tools. That'll probably coincide with our V2 launch that's happening in the fall. But yeah, I think there definitely needs to be, we try and, we have an FAQ. We have a lot of information out there, but it's, I know that it's maybe hard to find for every single user. So yeah, we're going to be yeah. doing a video series on that to kind of help clear the air on, on everything. Yeah. But we, we'll, we'll definitely like, clearly I will keep an eye on everything you're doing, but I, I want to revisit this monetization experiment of yours later on. And maybe we'll do another, just, you know, if it uh, works out particularly well, uh, we may just talk about that. And, uh, the different, uh, you know, ways the blockchain and cryptocurrencies can be used in the music uh, industry. It's a very big and global topic, but um, I like that you are working on something very practical because there is lots of theory in that area, a lot of talks, discussions, uh, which don't lead to too many like practical, impl uh, yeah, you know, yeah. just implementations. Uh, so what you are trying here is actually just uh, showing that exactly. it can work out. 
Uh, very cool, very cool. And, uh, <laughs> and is it like you are the, pretty much the only developer yeah. doing so, all that? Yeah, we, it took a little bit longer than it probably would with the whole team. But uh, yeah, I built Spectral from scratch uh, and I'm working on it every single day. Uh, most nights until maybe two or three in the morning. Uh, so it's a labor of love and I love doing what I do because, you know, we're trying to help the music industry work smarter. So that's what it's about. Keep it up. Uh, amazing job so far. Really looking forward to the second version of the platform and um, just all the updates, everything you were rolling out. And uh, I guess, yeah, anyone who's uh, interested in checking it out, we're linking to Spectral like in the show notes, of course, but it's not difficult to just find by Googling it or it's spectral.io. Yeah, feel free to spell it out. Yeah, S-P-E-K-T-R-O-L uh, dot I-O. So yeah, anyone curious to check it out, it's quite easy because you basically can create a free account right away. You don't need to wait for like, you know, it's not invitational or anything. And you can, the fact that you can just enter a URL, uh, a username on SoundCloud or whatnot. Yeah. And just start seeing the results. It's pretty cool. Uh, you, you, you've you been talking about quite a few electronic musicians. So just electronic music, let's say, you the, because I see that yeah. this is your background, but uh, we want to make it clear that even for there is a big accent on SoundCloud, I mean, it's it's really, there is nothing that's limited to any particular no, it's genre not. of it's, music, right? Uh, you know, we started out kind of, that was our base, our user base uh, when we started, but we are currently talking with like the Country Music Association of America and we've done stuff with, you know, gospel singers and a lot of people and hip hop and rap. So uh, yeah, we're all over. If you're on SoundCloud, it's probably a huge help. If you're not, we have a ton of stuff for Spotify. So, and if we're missing something, we yeah. just, you know, reach out and we'll probably put it up there in a week or so. so. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and great to and, uh, being available and open to feedback and so on. So uh, keep up doing the great job. Uh, really appreciate what you are contributing to the industry. And uh, thank you a lot for sharing all these cool hacks and tactics and tips uh, Thanks, with Andrew, our listeners uh, today. Thanks for having me on and yeah, hope to talk soon. Thanks to Chris once again and uh, to any of you who thought that uh, this recording sounded a bit weird at times, there was actually a synchronization issue of sorts uh, during the audio editing process, uh, so the two audio tracks uh, with uh, uh, Chris' voice and mine, the overlap uh, with, uh, with there is a slight unsync thingy going on. That's why uh, it may seem like we're talking at the same time, or you know, Chris replying me before I ask the question. Sorry for that. Uh, a bit of a technical glitch. We'll ensure it doesn't happen in the future. I hope you enjoyed this. Nevertheless, uh, to me, it was just packed with. Um, cool hacky things and a lot of that stuff uh, you probably know that already uh, and yeah if you have specific questions let us know uh, just reach out to Chris directly uh, and yeah you just you can use social media or the contact form on the website for that so with any questions uh, reach out to him and feel free to ask me questions about that as well in the comments or email me metaandroid.music.com or andrew at wispin.co, the same e email inbox essentially. Uh, uh, Patreon, just as a reminder, a great place to connect with me via uh, uh, my stupid phone number and just directly and receive a bunch of uh, additional content and so on. Also, as a reminder, if you have any interest uh, in uh, our services as a marketing agency, so if you're a musician or a music company uh, looking for growth, uh, please do fill out the form at agency.datamusic.com. It will take you a couple minutes and we'll get back to you with ideas on how we could be of help. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, uh, watch out for new episodes, working on some cool stuff, as I mentioned to you earlier, for this fall and winter. Uh, lots of great episodes coming up. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned and uh, have a great week. You've been listening to Music Growth Talks with Andrew Apanov. Find more episodes and subscribe at musicgrowthtalks.com.